Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be part of Indie Games Business Session. All these talks have always been super valuable for me, so I'm excited to share what I know as well. My name is Agne Vetkute, and I'm the head of publisher relations at Giround, a public playtesting platform for PC games. I've been in the games industry for almost a decade now, doing all kinds of business things from PR, business development, partner management with different companies like publishers and agencies and different startups. And my current focus is helping game developers and publishers gather community feedback, analyze it, and turn it into actionable steps that can help them improve their games. And this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. It's how to avoid a bad Steam score through playtesting. I'm going to give you some basic theory about playtesting and some practical advice as well. So I'm going to start off with explaining what playtesting is, what types of playtesting exist, and how it differs from QA. Then why you should playtest and what happens if you don't, as well as a couple of examples of launches going very, very wrong that could have been prevented through playtesting. Then I'm going to explain what successful playtesting process entails and what you should think about, as well as common challenges and solutions. Then I'm going to go through different playtesting data, why you should collect it, and uh, what answers you can get from them. And I will finish the talk with case studies from developers that playtested their games and had very good outcomes. So what is playtesting? In short, it's simply testing your game with people in order to improve them. In longer, it's actually a tool that you should have in your development toolbox that allows you to gather community data, analyze it, and turn it into something that can help you improve your game. So you add it to your pipeline, and it helps you improve your pipeline in, in return. So playtesting can help you test game design, art design. It can help you test different features. It could be full fleshed out features to see if they're up to standard, or it could be just an idea of a feature. For example, you have an arena mode or sandbox mode, and you see if people click on it when they're playing the demo. It's a very good tool to tune gameplay mechanics because Playtesters that play your game, they don't have any prior knowledge of the game. So you can see if your mechanics are intuitive and smooth and so on. And you can test user experience, whether the game is fun, whether it's clear what people need to do. And in turn, if you play test and you take into account all the feedback that you get, you improve that user experience and in turn, user feedback when you launch. There are no official like universal types of playtesting. Every playtesting service can give you a stretch test, feature tests, and so on. You can come across any types of playtests. So I like to categorize playtests either by size or by goals, because having these two categories can help you set up a playtest that works for your particular development stage. So the smallest tests are usually with friends and family. It could be anywhere from one person to like 10 people. Uh, when you barely have a game, it doesn't even have to have any assets. It could simply be primitives with core gameplay loop. And you tap your colleague on the shoulder and say, hey, what do you think? Do you think it's fun? And you can send it to your spouse. You can send it to your friends. You can send it to your grandma. And if somebody gets excited, you move forward. And if nobody gets excited, you go back to the drawing board and redo it. And sometimes you can just share the game design document and the idea itself and present it. So this type of test is free, hopefully. Hopefully you don't have to pay your friends and family for playing your game. And it's very quick because you use people around you. And you can iterate many times because it doesn't require any resources. The biggest drawback is that people around you are biased. They're either positively biased because they get excited because they love you, or they're negatively biased and very critical also because they love you, but they're terrified that you're going to fail. So they want to make sure that you know all the possible ways to fail. The next tier is focus groups. They're not necessarily bigger. They can be from like five people to usually 50 people. Some companies do 200 people, but that gets very expensive because these focus groups are usually run in a lab and a lab 
playtesting lab is a room with computers where hired playtesters play our game for a certain amount of time and you can watch them play you can ask them questions and they're less biased than your friends and family uh, because they don't have any relationship with you or your game uh, but still it's not a natural gaming environment we, we don't go to some weird rooms to play on someone else's computer especially with a developer hovering over your shoulder so there's still some bias as well because you pay people so they are either trying to avoid conflict and they don't say what's wrong with the game because they don't like confrontation or they become overly critical because they feel you're paying them to cr criticize the game so they need to give you your money's worth and that's not what how they would play the game and not natural reaction to the game bigger tests could be closed alpha or beta or it could be a private test for like a full game and these are usually run online so people play at their own homes and it's more natural user behavior it's similar to how people would play if they bought the game. So you don't necessarily tell them to play the game for eight hours or for 30 minutes. You see where people start dropping off. So this is less biased and more powerful tool if you want to have uh, more accurate data of the whole audience. Because if like one or even five people say that controls are unintuitive, that could be personal preference. But if you have 60 people saying that the controls are unintuitive, that is an issue. So closed tests are great. You can have these marketing um, strategies that include exclusivity. You don't have to have fully polished build, but it's difficult to recruit players for closed tests and enforce NDAs. You don't want to be the company that is suing a poor player. Like, nobody wants that. And that's not going to turn time back that somebody leaked your content. So in order to avoid that, you can just do straight up public tests, have everyone play your game and recruit even influencers to play your game. So they invite their, their viewers to play your test. And this usually requires more people you can have tests from like 300 to sometimes 100,000 people. And depending on your budget, uh, you decide how big you, your test is going to be so you can analyze all the data. There's no 100% rule that you need to test small when the game just starts out and you need to test big when the game is finishing. Sometimes it's enough to have a focus group to verify the final build. And sometimes it's good to have a bigger test early on because you want to verify if the idea of the game is interesting to a wider public and is worth investing the rest of your budget, like 90% of your budget, into a game. So you need to decide what your goals are um, for the playtest. So your goals can be to verify whether the game is fun, verify whether improvements that you made have had the intended consequences, and you can verify if the game is ready for a full launch. You can also play test to test specific features. You can have a small build that specifically tests the feature, or you can have a full demo with the feature on the site to see if there's interest in the feature, or you can just simply ask in a survey, would you like to see this feature? Then you can test for marketing purposes. So marketing demos is usually like Steam demo during Steam Next Fest or other showcases. It doesn't necessarily have to have a lot of feedback integration. Uh, it's good to gather that feedback, but it's not mandatory. You use this demo to attract players, to get wish lists, to spread the word about the game. And the demo itself has to be of certain quality when you want to release it so people come back and buy the game when it launches. And the last goal that I want to talk about is market sentiment. And this requires to have quantitative data, not only qualitative. It's not enough to have people share what they think about the game. It's good to have numbers to back it up. So you have to have a rating and 
even if you have written feedback, you have to parse the data and see which kinds of uh, feedback was mentioned most times. I think it's like a big industry misunderstanding that playtesting and QA are not different things. Every time I reach out to, well, not every time, but often when I reach out to a studio and say, we do playtesting, they're like, oh, no, thank you. We already have QA. And playtesting and QA are two completely different things. And they're both super, super important. And you cannot swap one for the other. Because if you do QA instead of playtesting, you will not know if the game is fun. You will not know if the game is intuitive because you have testers who played the game multiple times, play test it again. And if you do playtesting instead of QA, you will just have a buggy build because playtesters are not necessarily there to fix your bugs. So I'm going to go through main differences. And the first one is definitely testers. So people who play test your game are just regular gamers or your family. They're not professionals. They don't usually get paid for testing, or at least it's not their, their salary. And there's QA testers who are professionally trained. This is their main job. They know what they're looking for. And uh, they're just professionals in the industry that see the game through a different lens. So playtesters' focus is on personal experience. Did they like the game? Uh, would they buy it? Would they recommend it? Uh, when QA is just looking, does the game work? Is there any bugs? So the play, play style itself for playtesters is kind of similar to majority of your future customers. It's not necessarily the same because uh, your playtesters still know that they're looking to improve your game, but it's as close as it gets. While QA is literally trying to break your game and find the fringe cases that could come up later on. You will find some bugs through playtesting, and these are usually the most obvious, obvious ones. And QA testers are specifically focused on finding the bugs and eliminating them. They know how to report them. So it goes straight into your development pipeline. So the behavior of testers, uh, of play testers, is the, similar to the, the way they would play the game they buy. They play the game more than once if they want to. They play for as long as they want to. And QA players, test the games as much as it's needed. So imagine a branching narrative game. Play tester could play the game through once, maybe twice, with different choices. QA tester would have to go through every single possible uh, choice and every single possible ending. So both are very, very important if you want to have a good Steam score at uh, launch. And they are definitely different things. <laughs> so I recommend investing in both. Why you should play test your game? So first of all, poor user reviews at launch are difficult to recover from. If you launch with mostly negative reviews, you will never be overwhelmingly positive. You could be positive, but most likely you will end up with mixed reviews and that will hinder your sales. It can help you improve your development pipeline with priorities dictated by hard data. Just because you think that you need to make something doesn't mean that your community values that as much. So having playtesting dictate what, what your priorities are can save you development time and money. It's good to playtest often to minimize the risk of sinking too much resources in the wrong direction. So if somebody recommended you to implement a certain feature, you shouldn't flesh out the whole feature and then like create a bunch of content for it and then release it. Uh, you should create the idea of the feature, test it, see if people are still interested, if you're going in the right direction, do you need more content, how much more content you need, instead of just sinking more and more resources because one playtest told you so. And lack of data-driven audience research hinders successful go-to-market strategy. If you don't know what your audience is, whether it's male or female, or what age group, which regions uh, you're most popular in, you might have ideas. But unless it's verified, you can sink a lot of marketing budget into audience that is not necessarily your target audience. Just because you think it is, 
it's not guaranteed that it actually is. Or you might miss on people that you'd never consider. For example, if you have a 2D platform or maybe some puzzle gamers would actually like your game, but you just don't know. And what happens if you don't play test? You can lose millions in unrealized sales uh, releasing poor quality games. Big publishers and developers of anticipated games can still sell if their reviews are mostly negative. But if you're a smaller developer, people will just not buy your game. Like Even if they buy it, they will refund it. And then you will build a notorious reputation as a studio that releases bad games. So people will stop buying your games in the beginning, especially if they know that you might fix it later. So they will wait for you to fix it. You won't have enough budget to fix it and it will be overall bad. And bad reputation can hinder your future B2B relationships. People will not want to invest in you or publish you. So it can basically break your whole company. And if you launch and you can see that you can improve the game, you'll have your team crunch. You will maybe hire an outsourcing studio to make changes quicker. So you will sink more funds and you will hinder your team's morale when it's just not necessary because it could be prevented with playtesting. And you will also sink a large part of your budget into additional content or areas of the game that provide not that much more than less content. So if you have an idea to have I know, 2,000 weapons, will 2,000 weapons actually bring more benefit than I know, 150 weapons? Or if you have 40 characters, will that bring more value than 20 characters? You can test that with your community. You can see how much more they actually want and need because some of these things require a lot of development time and bring they still bring benefit, but not necessarily enough to warrant these changes. Now I wanna talk about some game launches that could have gone better if playtested. The first one is Wild Hearts by EA. So I chose this game. Uh, it has mixed reviews, not mostly negative and 47% rating because a lot of people wanted to like the game. There were so many reviews saying, I want to recommend it, but I can't. So I picked some user reviews and I'm going to go through them and see how it could have been prevented if the game was playtested earlier. Uh, so the first one is the issue is the game is very hard if you are solo and don't use the building mechanic. If you use the building mechanic, then it gets a lot easier and you can abuse it to the point that everything becomes too easy. This is kind of balancing issue. Like I'm not saying it's easy to fix, but it should have been caught and either the game has to be balanced to be easier for solo players or building mechanics shouldn't be abused. So these things, there's a very clear goal that could have been achieved to make this particular reviewer review the, the game positively. Uh, the other one, so there were a lot of uh, performance issues with good rigs. So I just picked one, uh, which is I'm running on a RTX 3070 and Wild Hearts frequently dips into the single digit frames and maxes out my CPU during monster encounters. Like I get this is a big game and the requirements are high, but even the higher end rigs couldn't run the game. So I didn't know how developers tested the game on what kind of uh, gear, but if 99% of people cannot play it, it's bad for business. Uh, the next one is quickly recycles content, small number of unique monsters, armor sets, and weapons. This could be a very personal opinion. So it's important to see if more people mention the same things, but if they do, uh, maybe developers could have worked less on lore and created more of things that their users wanted. So even if you have limited resources, if you have limited time, you can refocus your funds and attention to different things that improve the user experience rather than the game that you want to make. And last one is very straightforward. Camera bad, hitbox bad, audiovisual cues bad, dodge bad, balance bad. All these things are more tweaks than changes. So they should have been caught through playtesting before full launch. I'm not saying it's easy to change and tweak things, but it's not like creating a full feature or changing something significantly. 
And my next case study is even sadder. It's Babylon's Fall by Python Games and Square Enix. So the game is canceled, like fully canceled right now. It, they announced that it's going to be canceled in September. Um, and they actually play tested. They had a closed beta in 2021, which had some negative reviews saying the visual art style was hindering the gameplay because they have this like painting vibe to it, which is, I think, very cool personally, but it was hard to see what's happening in the game. And uh, another one was that the gameplay was kind of dull. And even though they played this multiple, a few times, uh, they didn't play this it right before the launch. And they probably didn't have good enough goals uh, to have the right answers through their playtest. Their first playtest happened four years into development. So I assume it's very difficult to make major changes when you already sank four years of development into the game. So if they tested earlier, they could have made bigger changes. And that's why it's important to not let your development get carried away and finish the game and just play test and see that nobody wants to play it. And they actually like they changed the art style that there are not many reviews mentioning uh, that the art style is bad. So they did this good, but the rest stayed the same. Let's go back into theory. So playtesting process consists of preparation, playtesting, and post-playtesting actions. When preparing for playtesting, first thing you need to think is your goals and objectives. If you don't ask the right questions, you're not going to get the right answers. So you need to know why you're playtesting and what you're trying to achieve and verify or get from it. And based on your goals, you choose the best playtesting form, whether it's open tests, closed tests, Steam tests, whatever. And then you prepare the build to get your audience give you feedback for what you want. So whether it's a small build that showcases a feature or if it's a full game, uh, you need to decide what kind of build you're going to play test. And you need to integrate the tools for play testing. So you know, have a, a Google, even a Google form with survey questions at the end of the game is good. It's better than having your users look to look for a place to leave feedback. If they have to go to Community Hub, or they have to go to your Discord, they need to at least know that. But the easier you make it, the more feedback you will get. During playtesting, also the first thing is to get players. Without players, you can't really playtest. But I will talk a lot more about recruiting players uh, later on during challenges and solutions. The next thing you need to think is patching the build throughout the playtest. Uh, there will be bugs. There always are. And if you don't improve the build throughout the playtest, you will keep getting the same feedback from people. It's not because they think you haven't received it, but there's sort of a mental block. If you see a big thing that affects the game, you report it. And then you kind of miss the smaller things. So if you want more variety and maximize your um, test results, you need to improve the build throughout so you don't get the same feedback over and over. Obviously, I'm not talking about big changes, but smaller ones, fixing bugs, that should definitely happen throughout. You need to make sure you're collecting feedback and data uh, and make sure you verify that it's being collected. So see if the survey is working and it's not going to disappear. See if people are leaving reviews. And then you need to process uh, those results. So you can average the ratings. You can separate the average based on different demographics. You can analyze the written feedback based on how often certain feedback was given. And after the playtest, you analyze those results. So you see if you were rated better by a Brazilian uh, market than your average. So maybe you should localize the game to Brazil, to Brazilian Portuguese. Or maybe you had a lot of people mentioning that your keybinds are wrong. So you need to analyze and turn it into specific changes that you need to make to improve your game. 
and then you need to improve that game. So you analyze that data to create steps, then you do those steps, and then you do another playtest to verify that whatever you did was good enough and what people actually wanted. Because a lot of it is still up for interpretation. So key factors uh, for successful playtesting is definitely setting clear goals and objectives. As I said, you can't get answers if you don't ask the right questions. Uh, effective co communication with playtesters is not only about telling your testers to focus on a certain feature, it's also about appreciating uh, your playtesters and thanking them for you know, giving their own time to you and to your game in order to improve it. You have to create a whole relationship with them because sometimes they're even working for you for free. Thorough analysis of playtesting data, it's pretty self-explanatory if you don't analyze why even playtest. And timely implementation of improvements. What I mean by that is it's not necessary, but if you implement improvements in certain intervals, you can use it to attract more playtesters. So let's say there's a playtest right now and uh, it finishes you say thank you so much for participating in three months we're going to have another playtest so people will be looking forward to it and if you don't implement enough changes to make the game significantly different people even if they come back they will not want to review it because they just don't want to repeat themselves again and they're probably not going to participate in the next uh, playtest but if you don't tell them that you're going to play this in three months. You're going to have to start from scratch uh, creating a playtesting community. So if you implement your improvements in a timely manner, you could maximize your playtesting simply through re reusing uh, previous playtesters. So one, one of the most uh, common challenges is recruiting playtesters and uh, if you've released any other games before, definitely engage with your community, even if you create if you're working on a game in a completely different genre. Those players that already invested in your games are likely to want to be part of your community no matter what you do. If they like your previous game, they're likely to like your new one. So don't forget them. Don't feel awkward that you're asking them to play a completely different game. Uh, they're probably going to be very happy that you think about them. A less obvious one is looking for students and inspiring game developers. But it's sort of a win-win situation because uh, students who study like game design or anything, they get a chance to see sort of inside of game development process, see that games are not necessarily perfect uh, until the end. And they start thinking differently, like critically, of how to improve the games. Um, and they also often get a chance to talk to you, network, and maybe get an entry-level position in like testing or an internship. So they're a lot more likely to, to join your playtest. Working with micro-influencers obviously is only applicable for public testing, but micro-influencers have very engage communities. So if they tell their community to come to your playtest, they're likely to bring more playtesters. Or you can just hire a professional playtesting service and just not have this issue. But that requires funds. And limited financial resources is another challenge. So first and foremost, you should talk to your publisher or investors. A lot of publishers have their own playtesting uh, ways. They either playtest with their community or they have a contract with a playtesting service that could give you a cheaper rate than you would get on your own. Same with investors. And even if they don't, if you present that playtesting can improve your sales or improve your pipeline, they want to help you. They're likely to increase your budget to accommodate playtesting. Ideally, you should buy it in playtesting one raising funds and not only one one round of playtesting, but multiple. So you don't spend time uh, on things you don't necessarily have to or you don't finish the game and see that nobody wants it. 
you can all also grow your playtest and communicate organically so you don't need the funds that's just social media try TikTok, try you know, twitter maybe some giveaways uh, it is a lot slower than paying for for things but if you don't have the budget this is the best thing that you can do Take advantage of competitions. By competitions, I mean pitching competitions and certain awards because sometimes they give vouchers as prizes, like playtesting vouchers as prizes. So definitely look into everything that is available around you. And check with your government if they can help you. Some of them have uh, separate funds for uh, services that developers can use. And some of them work with playtesting services like us um, and they buy a bunch of vouchers that they give away to developers in their countries. So definitely check out if your government has some sort of program that can help you playtest. The last issue is balancing playtesting with other development tasks. It's mostly time management. Like it's, I understand that it's hard to do everything at the same time, but if you integrate playtesting into your pipeline, you will know that this month you cannot work on major changes. You have to wait and it's not going to delay your, your full launch. And I say that because it's good to not do multiple times, at, uh, multiple things at the same time. I recommend Focus on playtesting, improve the build that you're playtesting. Don't work on the next big thing. Wait until you have all the data so you can prioritize the right things. And that will help you work smarter, not harder. So you don't have to flesh out a feature that nobody actually wants. There's different types of playtesting data. So there's quantitative data like rating, player behavior, and qualitative data like written reviews, surveys, and video content. I'm not really going to talk about player behavior because it's very game specific and it requires analytics. So you can see if people finished a certain level or uh, finished a certain quest so you can understand if people are dropping off at a certain area uh, in larger numbers. Or you can see if uh, people are preferring a certain faction or a certain character. So maybe you need to improve uh, like art of different uh, of other characters or factions. And also, I'm not going to talk about video content mostly because it takes a long time to show videos. Uh, that makes sense, but video content is super important when playtesting because it can give you first-time user experience. If you're playtesting in a lab you can see how people play and you can ask them why they're doing something. But if they just self-report, you don't really know uh, what they actually struggled on and if uh, the gameplay was as intended. So video content is the next best thing. You can see how people play your game, if they get stuck, if how they think about uh, solutions. So that can help you improve your game significantly. I will talk about all the other uh, data types. And one of the most important ones is rating because it's objective. Like There's no interpretation of numbers. So you can ask different kinds of ratings, uh, rating game idea, clarity, replayability. It depends on your games. You don't have any story. Don't ask about the story because the more questions you ask, people are more likely to just pick any number. So if you want more accurate results, ask only the important questions. And on its own, this rating doesn't mean much unless you compare it to other games. So if you have similar games in your portfolio uh, that you playtested before, you can see how it compares. You can ask your friends that work on similar games, or uh, you can just compare your playtests throughout time. So you get one rating when you first play test, then you implement changes. You see if the correlating game game part increases in rating. The way people imagine feedback is usually through reviews, and they are also very important. Uh, so these examples show people mentioning what graphics card they use and 
whether there were performance issues, there's voice acting adds to the whole. So you can extrapolate that you should continue what you're doing with the voice acting, but you don't necessarily need to improve it. Uh, so it doesn't have to be your first priority. Then there's a recommendation to have customer uh, character customization. This is a very big thing to ask. And if you only have one or two or three people asking for it, you should really think twice before spending development funds on such a big change. But there are smaller things like people getting lost or uh, the other reviewer felt that head bob was giving them motion sickness. So having a turn off button uh, for head bob is a small change that you could definitely implement and get a positive rating from something that could be negative otherwise. Another powerful playtesting data type is survey answers. So you have to know what you want to ask. And I'm going to give you a few examples and what kind of answers you can think about. So did you find the tutorial helpful? If no, please specify why. This is a question about clarity. Uh, what settings would you add to the settings menu? It's a UI question. What feature does the game lack the most? It's a suggestion question. Which tactic from the below did you use most frequently? It's user behavior question. Uh, if you could change one thing to make the game better, what would it be? This is priority question. So you can start prioritizing things that people mention the most. Name the game's biggest competition and how it compares. This can help you identify your unique selling proposition. Did you have difficulty figuring out the controls and interface? Was there any mechanics you did not understand? This is, again, clarity and uh, sort of game design as well. Uh, what do you think about the combat system and AI of enemies? This is, again, game design. Um, did the key art attract your attention and make made you click on the game? This is a marketing question that you can ask. And there's no limit to how many questions you can ask, but I don't recommend going over maybe 20, ideally less, because people don't really want to spend too much time because we have very short attention span. So what you should do with this data? First of all, you should adjust controls so you can make attacks faster or slower. You can make jumps uh, further. You can make anima animations more smooth. You can change art direction. That's what Babylon's Fall did. Uh, and it worked for them because the reviews didn't mention art in a bad way. You can improve combat. Uh, it could be AI. It could be adding new attacks. Uh, you could focus on the right content. So you can ask whether users want more weapon types or more enemy types. Uh, you can ask whether they want a longer story or more bosses. So you can focus on the content that your players want instead of what you want yourself. You can select best marketing assets. So as I said, key art is very important. And uh, you can not only ask it in the survey, but you can A-B test playtesting builds with different UI and see which one is more intuitive, uh, what people prefer. And you can ask about game description. Like, Was the game description accurate? And how would you describe the game? Uh, fixing bugs is very self-explanatory. I'm not going to go into it. Leverage positive user feedback in publisher negotiation is less self-explanatory. But if you play test with enough people, and they like the game, even if they see all the issues, this is your social proof that you can take to any publisher or investor and say, look, there's people interested in the game. And it's not my opinion. It is a fact. They like the game. They rate it positively. They say positive things. And all the negative things that are about the game, we're about to fix. And uh, it can help you go over that edge uh, when you're negotiating with publishers. The last one is canceling your game, or at least the feature. I know nobody really wants to hear that, but actually it's a very good economic decision to cancel the game early. And by early, I don't even mean like after two months. 
even after two years, sometimes it's better to cancel a game if nobody actually wants to play it or if you can make it okay and just get your money back because you lose all the opportunity to make another game or sometimes even two games that people will love. So you basically lose money in lost opportunities rather than actual money that you invested right now. And if you, if developers didn't cancel their games, we wouldn't have Slack because the creator of Slack had a fairly successful game, but it wasn't su successful enough. Uh, so he thought that instead of making a little bit of money, he'd rather cancel the game, give investors their money back and create something that can actually provide more value to, to his employees and the investors as well. And that's how why we have Slack. So I'm going to finish on a very positive note. I talked to one of the studios that playtested on Ground and asked, can you give me specific feedback that you received uh, from your playtest and how you implemented it? So they had a lot of different feedback. The first one was that some users thought the game was either too easy or too hard. So they decided to implement four difficulty levels. And it's a very creative solution because they could have just chosen one or the other and cater for specific niche audience, but instead they found a way to cater for more people. The way they use video content was in videos, we noticed that bad frame rate contributed to the game being harder and more frustrating to play. So it's always frustrating when the game uh, has low frame rate, but it's not necessarily harder to play. So for them, it became a priority to optimize the game further and improve the quality of graphics and also overall gaming experience. Another common feedback was that UI and UX needed a lot of improvements to better guide the players to navigate in the world and make it easier to understand how to upgrade the characters and make it more readable. So these were very specific changes that uh, were mentioned and implemented afterwards and developers revamped some menus and overall worked a lot on improving the UI and UX. And the map had a very conflicting comments. So some people pref preferred the 3D map that they had and others wanted a 2D map or a mini map for clarity. So they again thought very creatively about this issue and they improve their 3D map by refining how you control it and how it looks. They make made a good waypoint system that guides players in the world and made sure that the map can be positioned in a top-down position so it gives more of a 2D feel and it's very clear. Coridan is not launched yet, so I cannot say if it's going to have like very positive results, but either way, it's going to have definitely more positive results than it would have if these changes wouldn't have been implemented. Another case study is Strayblade. It's not about changes that they made. It's the playtest itself helping them secure funding to finish the game. Uh, they already were in negotiation with the publisher, but they did really, really well uh, in play on their playtest they had social proof that they presented to the publisher that got them over the edge to sign this publishing deal that secured their future and the launch. So I want to like summarize that playtesting might seem like a very confusing and difficult and long process, but once you get it done once, it's very straightforward and you can complete it multiple times again and again, uh, just changing your goals and analyzing data. So it's it's more confusing than actually getting Steam reviews. In, on Steam, your users are not asked to rate the game. They're only asked to say whether they recommend it or not. There will always be games, uh, there will always be users that come to your game and say, oh, uh, this is a first person shooter and I don't like FPS games. Who knows why they bought it? Who knows why they're reviewing it, but you cannot go get away from these people. But the reviews that you can improve are those where people say, I really want to recommend this game, but 
So if you address every bot, you will have more recommended uh, users than non-recommended. And in turn, your Steam score is going to be a lot better than it would be otherwise. So hopefully today you understood that playtesting is important in order to improve and evaluate your game. And lack of playtesting results in a bad Steam score and other issues like bad reputation. Uh, I didn't talk a lot about it, but I really want to iterate that cutting features or canceling the game early is a good economic decision. And focus groups, public and private testing all have pros and cons, and you're the only one who knows what's the right thing for your game. Uh, you can collect qualitative data like reviews and surveys and quantitative data like ratings and user behavior. Both are very important and tell you a different story about your game. Game developers can translate feedback into actionable tasks and playtesting data can help fund your game. So thank you so much for, for listening to me. It was a pleasure. Hopefully you learned something and and yeah, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to email me. Oh, we, we have questions. There's questions. We're going to pop up questions, and then you are going to be forced to answer them, all of them. No. It's, amazing. How are you doing? <laughs> that was amazing talk. Thank you so much. I'm doing good. I was very terrified before this talk, but oh, I calmed down during it. Yeah, it's like, whew, it's fine. OK, so now we're going to ask the hard questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. This is a two-parter right here from VCD Gamer. Very little people played my game that I've been working on. The few who get to play tests offered amazing feedback and it was a positive experience for them, but not many people playing still worries me. Here's the part. Do you have any advice on how to approach a larger player base without having to attend a conference like PAX or et cetera? Uh, yes. Yeah, so Recruiting players is difficult. As I said, I recommend trying to get free playtesting uh, through your government or through different kinds of initiatives. Actually, Jira and itself, we have Indie Games Initiative. If you don't have the budget, uh, but we like your game, we can offer you a free slot every now and then. So definitely look for ways to use services uh, if you don't have to pay for them. Otherwise, just slowly work your way up to get more uh, users in your community through social media and TikTok. I yes. know that TikTok is the big thing now. I know it's hard, but it works for a lot of people. Right, it does. It does for sure. It's really about building a community. And so, I mean, it's rough. Game development, community building, marketing, all of this stuff all at the same time. It can be a lot. And maybe it might just take a little bit longer if you're a solo developer. You know, the development process is not going to be just make the game, put the game out, and then you got money. There's a lot more to it, and it just takes a little bit longer. Unfortunately, it either takes time and effort or money. So you have to spend one right. or you the other. Or one, both. Right? It's a, the, where the circles overlap. Time, money, effort. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is kind of a comment, but I think we can uh, get a question from this. My game, Shattered Fay, has an open playtest on Steam. 135 players have hit the playtest button. Of the 135, only 27 have actually downloaded and opened the game. Only eight have joined the game's Discord. Uh, so I would imagine the question is, how do I change this? So, so this is pretty standard results, actually. Um, a lot of people uh, click on the Steam demo. Not that many actually play it, and even less uh, leave feedback. Mm -hmm. So it's still about community building. So this gave you a number of community uh, people in your community on Discord, try to use your community to attract more players. Ask them to invite their friends to Discord. Ask them to share on social media. So you in increase the number of total people looking at your game, and then that will increase the number of people playing your game and those who join. And try to get into different so showcases. So obviously, there's Steam Next Fest, but there's also like a dream hack showcase and other showcases that you can participate. So I highly recommend that. Right. And optimize your steam page, right? So I just posted a link into the chat. That is a, a video that we had from Chris, which is amazing. And it's really, he goes into depth about what you want to do for your steam page. I, I, I actually went and looked at the steam page of that and there, there's a lot of optimization that you, you need to do to get people to look at it. When you're optimizing your Steam page, make sure to 
think about how you look at games, right? Like, what do you do? What do you want to see when you go to a Steam page? I like to see gameplay right away. Um, I like the description to be, it doesn't have to be, it, it needs to be what the game, what the gameplay is, right? This is a first person shooter. Da, 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 right. I'm if, with if you. It, it's not about the story because sometimes people go straight into the story and like the world. And I'm like, no, what is this game about? Like, yes. how do I play it? And I looked at that game, and honestly, uh, the description was help me, Betty, help me test this game, and this and that. And I understand that's what you want people to do, but the, I still did not understand what the game is. It's a PvP game somehow, but I didn't quite comprehend what it was. And then there was some gameplay video, but it's just of the developer saying hey can you help me test this game but for me it's like i want to know what the game is before i'm gonna even download it so yeah elevator pitch has to be your description right and and then down at the bottom if you, you can have a big banner that says help me test this game right but don't have that be the featured thing that's my suggestion yeah. anyways okay yes well that was fun i love giving feedback uh here we go this one is from sam gomez on youtube what's the right moment in the development of a game to start play testing as soon as possible mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just different types of play testing as i said asking your friends and family to test your game is play testing and you should do that and every time you think of uh when every time you reach a milestone and you're thinking of investing more funds into something, play test before and verify that what you're thinking of investing your money in is worth it. Right. And play testing with your friends and family. There's one thing about that. Like your mom's always going to go, oh, that's so nice. You know, and uh, you got to like, please just give me genuine feedback. Don't just say you like it because I made it right. Tell me. Things, yeah. Right? So, so when I say friends and family, they don't necessarily have to be your mom. Like try to find <laughs> friends of friends right. <laughs> maybe that are less involved with you so yeah somebody that gives you feedback that's not going to be about you oh you did a great job making this but about the actual game is so pretend i didn't make the game just tell me what you think of it yeah right? so you, you can do that at game jams like you can mm -hmm. ask people at game jams to say what they think about your game and they're going to be less biased than your mom <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> i love that less biased than your mom that's a mom joke <laughs> it's right a very there. low bar <laughs> right uh, Jacob Harrison, how do you reconcile platforms with very different receptions, such as iOS receiving five by five, five out of five with many glowing reviews versus Android with low ratings and reviews? So I don't have expertise in mobile gaming uh, for playtesting, but from what I know about mobile games, uh, iOS players look at games differently than Android players and Android players just don't want to spend money on it. And right. iOS players prefer to just spend money once and have it. So you have to design the game differently in a way if you want to maximize one platform or the other, or you have to compromise for both. I agree. Yes. Okay, let's remove that one. Oh, uh, here we go. We've got a couple more. Look, we can burn through these so good from Discord. I'm a content creator that would love to get into participating in playtests. Can you suggest any methods to discover game devs who are seeking testers? Um, well, definitely join Game Round. We, we are always looking for our content creators. Other than that, uh, I just go on Twitter and Twitter. search for... Yeah, I search for... Hashtag for, Indie Game. Exactly. Actually, that's what I do. Like, you know, there's screenshot Saturdays and so on. But uh, the way I look for our developers is find cool game and then see similar accounts or what they follow because indie developers follow other indie developers right. and then and see actually, if they're working on anything. You could build some kind of portfolio for yourself as well. Like if you play test a game, then you can like start up things. I play tested this game and I gave this kind of feedback. You start a portfolio and then when you reach out to game dev, say, hey, I want to play test for you. You could show them the little portfolio that you've been making, right? Like I was talking about that in the last, uh, um, last talk about keeping a journal like as a content creator, I've been one for over a decade. I wish I would have kept a journal of all of the indie games. I, I, um, all the indie devs I worked with, all the money raised for charity, all of that stuff. And I didn't, and I really wish that I would have, cause it, I mean, it would look at it. It would be an amazing resume, but it is what it is. So that's what I suggest you do. Make a journal and do that kind of stuff. This, I just got sidetracked, but that's okay. 
Uh, another one from Discord. We are trying to streamline our release. How do we prioritize squeezing in and play test with an already saturated schedule? Uh, yeah, this is this is why you schedule it in before mm -hmm. and be before you have your whole schedule. Um, so find a time when you're not working on a new thing yet, and uh, just play test then and direct some of your attention to play test. Like you don't necessarily have to improve your build throughout the test. Like it's it's good to do. It's not mandatory. You don't necessarily have to be very engaged with your community. It's good to do, but it's not mandatory. Just be present, do the play test, implement some of the things that people mention. And then it might open up your schedule. If you see that you're working on something that nobody wants, then right. here's your time. <laughs> And uh, see, this goes back to yesterday. There was a uh, in the talk discussing the worst video game the ever made, which was the ET Atari 2600 game, and it was made right about the time when ET was super popular. But the game dev was just all by himself making a game that he thought would be awesome, no feedback, nobody else. He was just all by himself, and then they released the game, and it was terrible. So that it still happens makes... nowadays and that's mm -hmm. not even one person uh, making the game it's like thousand people making the game and all loving it and then there's no audience that loves it yeah yeah i've seen some big games come out and then it's just kind of like hmm. yeah it's all how so, the game feels right i, th okay. I think it's important to play test uh and, so and and make your your schedule available for play testing it's rather so, cut so features. Important. It's better to cut features than not play test. Right. Like, cut features and don't feature creep. <laughs> another feature and another and another and another. And then you're like your October of 2020 release date is now in 2023 because you've got all these features that you added because of feedback. You got to find your balance, right? Yeah. From Discord, suppose none of my friends or family is interested in games and are willing to assist me with playtesting. Do you have any recommendations for re reliable individuals or groups to approach for help? Uh, game jams is game jams. my number one. Game jams, Discord groups. Uh, there's a lot of indie developer Discord groups, and people like to help each other out and give feedback. So this is free, and join them on Reddit, on Facebook, on Discord. Yes, yes. Just reach out. You got to do the legwork, right? For sure. Thank you so, so much. This is awesome. And of course, right when people pull up to the house and the dogs start barking. Uh, so next we got Brian Etheridge, uh, Steam Next Fest, prepping for, for the dog barking, for the marathon. Thank Bye. Thank you so much.